Hello and welcome back to another episode of DF Direct Weekly. I'm John Lineman. This is episode 30 or week 38, depending on who you ask. Uh, and I have two wonderful people with me today to talk about all sorts of things, games, tech, uh, a rather interesting Nintendo Direct that just happened, all kinds of good stuff. So firstly, this one's interesting. I'm joined by Audie Surly. How's it going, John? Pretty good because I am actually joined by you. Let me just here there's my hand we've, we've actually got the setup happening he's in the same room as me for the first time since we've done this i felt like you were much closer to me today and this is the explanation why uh but it's great to be here i thought maybe you're going through a oh. portal what's oh, that voice he, spo- he spoiled it who's that voice who's that voice who's I, that? I i i hear something john it's it's cory carlson from my life in gaming hi how's it going pretty good it's good to have you here cory uh, Richard is out on assignment. Actually, no, he's taking a little break and Alex is actually out on assignment, you could say. So we thought we'd get a fun guest in here and what better one than Corey, especially with some of the news happening this week. I thought you'd fit right in. And to, to mark this momentous occasion, we all wore the same exact shirt. By coincidence. I assure you it by was coincidence. a coincidence. <laughs> At least uh, two out of three by coincidence. Then third That's true. might have been peer pressure. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and it's but, also like one of the best shirts ever made. I think. It really is. It is it's very it is, soft. It is uh, quite good. I'm not sure if it's a polyester wool, but uh, whatever it is, it feels it good. It works. Gentlemen, let's start this DF Direct with news item one, the Nintendo Direct. All right. First up on this week, uh, obviously, this is the DF Direct, but there was a different Direct, the Nintendo Direct, that just happened yesterday, last night, depending on your time zone. Uh, They showed a lot of stuff. This thing's been teased for a while. And personally, I was pretty satisfied with what they showed. I mean, what do you guys think? It was was good, right? Uh, I really enjoyed the show, top to bottom. Uh, There was some (laughs) surprises. There were some things we've uh, kind of speculated on for a while. But I think uh, overall, Nintendo just has this uh, direct thing down to a T. They they always deliver at least a good show. And I think this uh, ranged Mm -hmm. up from uh, very good to great. I would say we are forever the second best direct. Uh, <laughs> we, I'm sorry to say. Audie, you do a terrific, terrific, terrific job editing the show, show but, you know, uh, hard, it's hard so to much. beat Nintendo. Uh, I'll, I'll gladly be second to Nintendo. <laughs> um, so the first game I want to talk about actually is Kirby and the Forgotten Land, or Hoshinokabi Discovery, uh, as it's known in Japan. Uh, this one is really interesting because it's actually the very first time that Kirby has actually entered the third dimension in terms of gameplay. I mean, he has been polygonal before many times, in fact, but this time it's a full 3D platformer, which is something that uh, I think a lot of people have been wanting for decades since the N64, I would argue. And what they've shown here is this beautiful looking sort of post-apocalyptic take on Kirby, which arguably the series has always had such undertones in the past so it kind of works but i don't know what, what do you think about this Corey? uh i was pretty surprised to see this i had no idea that it was that it was coming but uh i'm kind of i would say a fair weather kirby fan in that you know i like the mainline games but i don't really play any of the spin-offs and everything or anything like that i know for a while there there was only spin-offs and then it, it brought it back with uh i think it was return to dreamland on the wii and the games have been consistently good. But I think it's interesting because apparently since uh, the 3DS games, a lot of the game's endings have been kind of building up in a way that connects them to other games. And the idea that this is a like a post-apocalyptic, like it looks like a human city. And I got this idea that like, what if Kirby takes place after humanity has died out? This gets very dark very quickly when Corey's on the show. <laughs> I, I think that's a cool idea, and I actually kind of, I don't know if they'll channel the humanity has died out thing, but uh, clearly this is definitely, I mean, it's right in the title, it's called Forgotten Land, although I do think it is more interesting to read into the Japanese name, where they just call it Discovery, uh, because that tends to more channel what the designers were are thinking about with this one, you would say, um, so I don't know, I mean, it has a little bit of a Last of Us vibe, but colorful, which in turn, I think I said before, it's a uh, kind of reminds me of the introduction sequence to um, Spirited Away when they're exploring the sort of amusement park area before being whisked away to another world. It's really, really beautiful looking, though. I mean, Audie, what do you think? 
Yeah, so like Cory, um, I'm kind of, I always get very happy when I see Kirby, but I don't play the games all that much. I think the last time I was really into Kirby games was Epic Yarn, and then I did play that Wii U Claymation one, because I really enjoy Claymation animation films, and I was kind of let down by that, so Kirby went to the wayside for me a little bit. Uh, but when I look at this trailer, I was immediately interested because this, you know, was fully uh, 3D adventure with Kirby, and the music sounded uh, excellent. It has this; uh, it's still a virtual orchestra, but uh, maybe in the game when the game releases, they'll upgrade it to a real orchestra, uh, like with uh, Odyssey and other games like that. Uh, but I was really interested because yeah, it is this contrast between like the blue blue skies, happiness, and then the, this uh, mystery that Koizumi was taunting us with in his uh, description of the game. So I'm really curious whether or not it does go down these uh, deep dark uh, dystopian paths that Cory is uh, playing with here, <laughs> or whether or not you know, uh, like John says, with the discovery name that you're just kind of constantly picking up clues. Yeah. And there is some kind of like semblance here uh, within the Kirby universe because apparently, yeah, it has a lot of dystopian <laughs> um, elements throughout the series, which I definitely have picked up on. Unfortunately, it would also seem that the frame rate itself is in ruins. Uh, well, maybe okay, maybe not. That's not that's not accurate. Uh, so I did notice that it does seem to be thirty frames per second and maybe not even stable. But again, it's not out till next year. A little bit disappointing, to be honest, especially when you look at like what they were doing with like Super Mario Odyssey being at sixty. But it is what it is. It still looks great. Um, but beyond Kirby, we should talk about some of the other stuff. One game that is still targeting 60 frames per second. And it is a game that has been absent for the better part of four years since its original announcement. It was Bayonetta 3, right? From Platinum Games. Uh, yeah, this one has basically disappeared for all those years. Nobody knew what was going on with it. Uh, it does suggest that there was development issues along the way. But looking at this, I mean, it looks like more Bayonetta, right? Like, it doesn't even... Like, it's not... You wouldn't expect a massive tech upgrade either here, given that it's the Switch still, right? So it's not a huge upgrade over the Wii U's capabilities, but it looks good. I mean, I, I like the, the style of the action that they're delivering. The visuals look good. The action looks good. Um, I'm curious about what they're doing with the story. I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, I think it looks excellent. I'm, I'm a, a massive fan of the first Bayonetta. Uh, it's one of the few games that I've ever got that I ever got 1,000 out of 1,000 gamer points on it. And, uh, you know, I, I liked the second one, but it, it the, the climax of the first game was so over the top that I didn't feel that they could ever do anything that would even come close to that. So I, go, I knew, like, going into the second game that they wouldn't be able to top that. And, I you know, I played through the second game twice, and uh, I can't really remember too much about it except for the fact that it has a lot of boss battles compared to the uh, compared to the first one um but i i think it looks good i'm always up for the that particular brand of platinum action you know i'm a big fan of like the witch time like you know uh doing a dodge and everything uh slows down like witch time yeah and um you know i i basically like every platinum game that i play and i haven't played ninja turtles so which I hear is bad, but, yeah, but... <laughs> uh, platinum, you know, for all their issues that we have seen from time to time, they generally turn out amazing games. At least I feel they do. Uh, and I have a lot of hope in this one as well. I mean, the level design thing is an interesting point because I do think too also went a little bit too heavy on the battles, boss battles and less like world exploration, which was a little bit disappointing. I mean, Audie, what do you think? Yeah, strangely, I was kind of tagged a lot regarding this day game this morning, <laughs> as uh, people thought I was a massive fan of Bayonetta. And I have to say, again, kind of like with Kirby, I played the first game like Corey did. I uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, I helped uh, cover the HD remake thing with John last year. Uh, so it was fun to revisit that. But uh, for Bayonetta 2, I wasn't too much into it. But I looked at this trailer, and I was, you know, I really liked Bayonetta's redesign. Uh, I really enjoyed Vina as a character and just her designs in general. Uh, I really enjoyed just her confidence and how she actually wears it and then how the world around her reflects that confidence. So it's always cool to see kind of where to go with Vina as a character, just in her, her designs. 
uh, for the actual appearance of this game <laughs> uh, prior to this, because this direct actually showed up on minimal notice. It was announced like the day before, and uh, John and I had to scramble of our schedule to fit this in. Uh, but uh, when we saw it, uh, John actually asked me, do you think Binary 3 is going to be there? And I was like, well, it's probably going to be there at the very end, but no date, no nothing. Uh, just 2022, even though that the direct, uh, the description of it said, games launching this winter. And guess what? Yeah, yeah, you were definitely right about that. Um, you know, As I often am. <laughs> yes, as you often are, it turns out. Uh, that's interesting. Um, another thing I want to talk about real quick, uh, we shouldn't talk too much about the details because it's coming out soon, and it's Metroid Dread. They showed that, and I specifically bring it up because, as we always do, Audie and I watched both the North American and Japanese version of the Direct, and they often showed different stuff in that version. And in the case of Metroid, I was really amused by the difference because, you know, in the U.S., it's very atmospheric. It's the dark Samus atmosphere and kind of like a lot of gameplay being shown and just kind of building that Metroid vibe that they go for. In Japan, though, they used a much shorter trailer uh, with a lot of action and like sort of a rock pop vocal song, uh, which felt completely different from the, the, the vibe of actual Metroid games, which I guess has to do more with the different marketing that they're trying just because Metroid is less popular in Japan than it is in uh, the rest of the world. It's been this way for, since actually the Game Boy Famicom days, if you look at the commercials for Metroid, it's always been much more action-oriented than right. what we got, because Western fans are always into the you know Metroid aspect of it, the exploration, the atmosphere. And uh, you saw very clearly to go between these two trailers, the differences here are vast. And also that trailer for Metroid Dread in Japan was uh, very short compared to the American one. Uh, we won't show too much footage right now because people are trying desperately to avoid spoilers from Metroid Red. So uh, I will respect our audience and I won't show too much, but uh, just uh, check out the song after the game releases. Go check out the Japanese trailer because that song, man, is uh, it was awesome. Uh, the next thing to talk about real quick is, um, I think some of this stuff has been hinted at for a while, but the Nintendo's the Nintendo Switch Online has been or is being updated with more games, and I think it's based on. I think they're actually charging more for it, which is interesting. <laughs> it feels uh, really confusing what they're doing, whatever they're doing. It does. It's it's weird, but either way, they're adding both uh, Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive games and Nintendo sixty four games again. Uh, I want to comment on the N sixty four stuff first because, quite frankly, it doesn't look great. Um, they're using the same kind of. The emulation looks somewhat shoddy, as it always has. The texture filtering is wrong, of course. Uh, they run the 3D at a higher resolution, but then, of course, the 2D elements are filtered very poorly. So you have this ugly mismatch. It just looks like a poorly configured PC emulator, uh, which I don't love. Um, and beyond that, in the European version of the Direct, they showed everything running the 50 hertz PAL versions of the games. Um, I think you can actually switch that, though. Uh, to different regions I, I i do think that's actually possible so you shouldn't be locked into that it should be noted but it does seem like by default the pow region will probably have those awful 50 hertz versions which n64 was the worst generation for pow by far it's so bad i lived it i know i know and <laughs> i'm the only one in the room that has lived through the nightmare that was pow 64 and uh yeah when we saw the 50 hertz stuff i would it would be totally up nintendo's alley to just leave it like that because uh and uh, in the past it has always had to do with localization the yeah. fact that those pal versions do have the english french and german uh but the right thing to do would be to have at least a choice so that people like myself who uh prefer to have this in 60 hertz can play those versions when we were watching it try sends me a message and he says Wow, I can't wait to play 64 games with a forced border. We're we're pretty anti like border around uh, the screen if we can. And the the one that's included with the the Nintendo Switch Online is awful. It's pretty awful. Yeah, I, I it tries to be not awful. I think I think they they probably don't think it's that bad. But just I wish they would just give us the option to completely turn it off full screen. You know, I commented the audio. This actually made me think. So. Burn in on OLEDs is not a big deal. Image retention is still there. It's especially with the newer panels. It's not a big deal. 
Uh, but why chance it, right? Why have that stuff displayed? And I say that because they're just releasing the Switch OLED. And now they have to think about that as well. You don't want to leave these static elements on screen all the time. Again, it's likely to not cause a problem, but it is like there's no reason to force that. And it looks ugly and it adds that extra issue there. And it's just, don't do it, guys. Like, fix that. Especially if you're asking people to pay for this stuff. And Totally agree. And, you know, like, Nintendo's not the only one that's doing that kind of thing. Even, even M2, who I love, like, has a no option for just a, like, a black border on the uh, Nintendo Switch Sega Ages stuff. It's always, like, this kind of gray gradient. Just, like, just give us an option for nothing. I agree. That's that's all I want, especially again, since I just talked to OLED screens or spoke about OLED screens, um, you know, they do perfect black, right? So when you play a game with a border around it that's just black, it just fades into nothing. There's nothing Show lit. this off uh, with uh, Death Stranding Director's Cut. That's right. Exactly. It's the same thing there. So uh, so that's kind of weird. I mean, in the Mega Drive stuff, Genesis stuff, really good game selections, but that stuff's been around for so long on these different machines. And you know, it just it just feels like they're just retreading old ground. Although I have to give them props for uh, for on the Genesis for putting Musha on there. I know I think that was on the Genesis or that was on the the Mega Drive Mini in Japan, but it's it's nice to see that show up on this service, especially since that game is incredibly expensive these days. My final comments on this really would just be that I find it somewhat strange to have an online service that has an expansion pack for the service <laughs> itself yeah. uh this uh i mean it's very nintendo i suppose and uh it frustrates me so much with this virtual this isn't virtual console but it's the successor to it and the fact that we always start over and we kind of have to feign a bit of excitement that these games are coming back but they've been there before and i'm always just kind of like man can't we just get a service that continues from console to console because we have this, uh, the wii the wii u now the switch and i guarantee you the next time we get a, a hardware from nintendo it'll probably start over again yeah and you know if they're gonna if they're going to charge more to add you know these two different additional virtual like on virtual console services uh i think if they're charging additional money they should make it a priority to add games faster to it because now it's not just included with everything else. Like this is, you're you're specifically paying more more money to, you know, to have access to more games. So continue to incre- increase that, and don't give us two games for each service every two months. Oh, it is interesting though that they're doing the new controllers, wireless controllers again. Cool for Sega. That could be useful for other things. But beyond that, uh, it's neat that they're doing an N64 an N64 pad. Uh, I'll be curious to see what the bottom looks like because I, you know, I assume they're going to remove the memory card slot, uh, which will make make it sit on a desk better, to be honest. But what we're really curious about is the analog stick build. I mean, knowing Nintendo, it'll probably be the same design, but I'll be curious about the materials, if it's any higher quality. Uh, Not that I'm suggesting everybody should take these and cannibalize them for old controllers, but, you know, I'm just saying. I would hope that they fix the analog because I really, I... You know, I played a lot of the uh, wrestling games back in the day, obviously, and that really wore down on it, especially also the boxing games like Knockout Kings just broke your controller after a few rounds. But it does make me wonder, though, that now that these controllers are in production, if that makes the likelihood of a N64 Mini in the future more likely as we now have these controller builds back. Very possible. But one thing, you know, John mentioned the memory card, and that just got me thinking, I wonder if these are going to have rumble built into them oh you know like i wonder if they don't put oh. anything for a like a like a memory pack down there and it's just like a little like a nub type thing it doesn't have an opening like why not just build like uh like rumble into that empty space that they would have so yeah that's the nintendo switch online stuff um not super exciting but there's some interesting elements of course they said more games were coming, and they did show in Japan Custom Robo is coming, and then in the West uh, was Banjo Kazooie and stuff like yeah. that. So I, I guess they the... figured those games out. Cool, that they have Win Back in there, by the way. Yeah, Operation Win Back is a cool game. I will say this though: I mean, this type of stuff is really weird for us to talk about in the sense that I think all of us have better, superior ways to play in sixty-four games. 
Uh, so it's not really that interesting. This is more for people that might remember N64 and didn't have a good way to play it today. Uh, so it's it's good for that specifically. Um, but you know what else? What else is also good? Maybe uh, Chocobo GP. Anyone? Chocobo Racing is back. Are you guys? Who's ready? I am so ready for this. And yeah. What made my body even more ready was the music selection. Yep. Of this trailer. We had Melody of Life. Uh, we have, of course, other classic Final Fantasy songs. And man, I loved these games on the uh, PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was so happy to see this come back. But then we saw the frame rate. <laughs> it seems like every time you use a special move the frame rate drops uh the trailer was all over the place it looks like they're targeting 60 fps but it just can't hold it and it's just constantly dropping and you know given how good mario kart 8 still looks and how perfect it runs on the switch at 1080p native no less this doesn't actually look more impressive than that it just kind of it's disappointing to see. I mean, it comes out next year, so there's still a chance to fix it. But man, it looked rough right now. And that's the that's the key, right? It's the fact that because there's probably people who's like, who cares about frame rate? Stop mentioning that. But the fact that Mario Kart 8 Deluxe exists on the Switch, and then you have this that is looks very close, by the way, uh, in nature, then uh, it kind of is like, well, the direct comparison will be there, and if it doesn't perform as well, or at least closer to it. And you have these uh, pretty significant drops in the midst of the action, the actual action, then that uh, isn't as fun as what Mario Kart delivers. It does. I think it looks uh, looks pretty good. I think I was I was it was a pleasant surprise and something that I never really expected to to see. And you know, thinking about I I don't know if there's any more like in Japan or anything like that. But I think the the last game at least that we got was like even before Final Fantasy IX had even come out. So it's it's been quite a while, and that's what it was nice to, about seeing the, uh, you know, or like hearing the Final Fantasy IX Overworld music, because that that is one of my favorite aspects of the original Chocobo Racing is just the remix of the music. I love, I love the uh, the dragon uh, theme from Final Fantasy V that was in the uh, in Chocobo Racing. Just you know, it's just it's just it made me smile seeing this. I really hope they can pull this off and create something that's really evocative and fun. I mean, for me, the high watermark of kart racer is still Sonic and all stars, uh, racing transformed because like not, it's not only are the core mechanics phenomenal, but like the way that they bring in that Sega history and like bring everything together and the crazy track designs. And it's such a good game. It's so interesting and fun. Heck, they could just re-release that uh, like 60 FPS on modern consoles and it would be fantastic but um so but obviously square can kind of do the same thing they can tap into that nostalgia we already know they have the music there Uh, yeah vb from like uh nine in there yeah exactly so this could be really good and i hope they can pull it off and fix the technical problems yeah i want to quickly mention that they finally announced was the castlevania advanced stuff Mm -hmm. uh, also from m2 yeah um and I I'm actually I am actually a fan of most of these games. Mm-hmm. The Circle of the Moon is perhaps the least interesting of them, but it's still interesting in its own way. And I think it's great to have these more accessible now, especially given the cost of like Aria of Sorrow these days. Oh, is is Aria uh, of Sorrow pretty expensive? I knew that Harmony of Dissonance was really expensive, but I didn't realize they that. both are. They both are. They're both up there. That's really cool to see. Uh, it is just a little bit weird that Dracula X, the Super NES game, is in there. Like, I mean. It feels like they were just like, well, what what else can we include in this pack to flesh it out? In my opinion, what they should have done is they should have included the the PSP version. Mm. Like that that would have made yes. more sense than go with the with the portable aspect of it. You know, I agree. That would have been neat, especially if they updated the frame rate. Yeah. Do any of you remember if in the Castlevania Collection, the one that actually has released, is the Game Boy games there? Those are both there. Wait, both. Is there only two of them? Well, it, 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 Legends is no longer canon, so that I think that it's Doesn't just matter, like... Doesn't matter, Corey. Oh, I know. No, 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 I, w- I would have loved it for for that to be in there, because especially since that's really expensive, too, but they're probably thinking, like, yeah. oh, you know, that was one of the few games that they made sure that was was not canon, because when they did uh, Lament of Innocence, that was supposed to be, like, the first one, you know? And, and originally, Legends was supposed to be the first one. 
I enjoy Legends though, and it has the first female protagonist right now. So the game is not great though. It's not great, but like this, these compilations. Whenever people say, "Well, that game is not great," I always am just like, "Doesn't really matter. I just I want agree. the completeness." I think we're on the same page with that, Audi. Where it's like, it's more. It's not about including just the great games. It's about including all the games. So yeah. You have a complete catalog of the history of a, of a series. That is really important. Yeah. Because the yeah. bad games will tell you what makes the good games better. So there's a lot of value to be taken from bad games. Exactly. Trust me, I have a huge collection of them. And what what's interesting also is like I have not played this yet. I'm not sure if you guys have, but I've heard that this does not have any sort of like like grid pattern overlay filter. Really? Oh. When which was, was weird because it was too. so good. It was like that was so good with uh, the the previous collection for the Game Boy games, and that's I, I have no idea why they wouldn't try to recreate that. It's a little less necessary for GBA, I think, but it would still be welcome. Yeah, I mean, it just put it in there because it it helps complete the look for some people, I think. But maybe that'll be added in, in a patch later on because that was uh, when the last collection came out. I remember that they didn't. In, in the U.S. version, they did not give access to the Japanese games at first, and then they were enabled through a patch. Uh, another one that we're not going to talk about, we should mention, was Act Razor Renaissance. And the reason we're not going to talk about it is because we're doing a video on it, and it's probably already out by the time you're watching this, unless you're a patron. Um, but uh, I guess the, the one thing I will say is if you haven't seen that video, just take caution. This was announced at a direct, but it is on other platforms. If you have a choice, don't play it on Switch. Okay. It's the worst version by <laughs> far. Uh, trust me. I'll have it's to watch fine that. on PlayStation, fine on PC, uh, and I mean not perfect. There are issues with it, but it's not performance related. It's a different thing, which we'll cover in the video. Do you guys have any like foreknowledge at all of this even coming? Uh, so Kushiro san has told me over the last few times I've spoken with them that like you know there's been interest in Act Racer and there's been other projects regarding Act Racer recently. Uh, so uh, I knew that like activity was going around, but I never knew that there was actually a game of production. I've only been aware of the orchestra recordings and things like this for other right, projects. Right. What I'm I'm hoping for, I've not played it yet, and I I do plan on buying it. Uh, I mean, I hope it gets a physical release at least, uh, like in in Japan. You know, like an import and it has English on it. But I I'm I'm hoping that this is them testing the waters to perhaps bring back or remake some other quintet games such as you know specifically like the Gaia series like the uh like Soul Blazer uh uh Illusion of Gaia and uh and Terra Enigma Terra Enigma has been very much in the news lately because the original team are trying to revive it oh really Successful. even the uh like the directors or whatever like weren't they like disappeared they uh, like st still missing okay but the other people <laughs> okay but that's uh, that's what I'm most excited for. I'm hoping that this does well enough and is well well enough received that they will do these other games because, you know, it's it's nice to see Square uh, embracing the 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 Enix side, I guess, as well. And uh, you know, there's these these are the all those games are very very good. And it is interesting that this is not really a remake either. So. Uh, I'd be curious to see what they do with those. Like it's a remake in the sense that it's like the same basic concept and design, but all the levels and so much of the gameplay is really different. Really? So well, I'm, it is not just a straight remake. I'm like half tempted to watch your video or maybe I just like go in. Watch our video on this. It's very interesting. <laughs> it's Im I think it's important to watch it actually, especially in this case. Um, but anyway, the, enough on that. Um, not to say too much, they also announced like KOTOR, Knights of the Old Republic, Star Wars is coming to the Switch, which is interesting. This is uh, not the remake. Not the remake, just <laughs> that they announced on the PlayStation. I was going to say, I was, at first I was like, this is this is not going to be the remake, right? Because I, I thought it looked, yeah, it did not look, <laughs> it, you know, as someone who only played the original like very, very lightly, because I guess at the time when I tried to play it, I, I couldn't really wrap my head around it. And I I forgot about it for a long time. And then seeing it in this direct, I was thinking like, oh, that looks a lot worse than I remember it looking. I mean, it never looked very good. I mean, especially 
the original Xbox, the frame rate was horribly unstable. The animations were ultra janky. I mean, it was, it was a PC RPG of that era. And most of them were like, just not, they were not great looking games in terms of the way they moved and looked in action, but it made up for it with depth in gameplay and storytelling. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what it was about and it is a cool game. Uh, and it's nice that it's, you know, it's good to have a, a, that on a portable, I suppose, because it's, it's a good game to put to sleep, pick up and play, you know, just kind of keep going. So the Mario movie, they didn't show a trailer, <laughs> but they did announce the voice acting cast, which was super interesting. When, when they first went into that, it, it made me realize like, man, we haven't seen Miyamoto for a while. I feel, I feel like, and it's like, it's like, have we even seen him just like, you know, rocking the like straight gray hair. Like, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I'm not, I'm not a huge, uh, illumination fan, especially since, you know, like my kids like the minions, but it's like, us. Oh, it's like, does not, it doesn't do anything for me. Uh, but you know, if they just translate the, the look of the games over to it, over to the, the movie, it's going to, it's going to be just fine. It's going to be weird hearing uh, Chris Pratt's voice coming out of Mario's Mario's mouth. But, you know, Chris Pratt did a great job in in the in the Lego movie. And so I, I feel like he's it's going to be a good fit. I hope they do the DreamWorks animation mouth where everybody's got the cocked mouth to the side, you know, like B movie and everything. Just like Mario with the with the side cocked mouth would be amazing. <laughs> so when they announced this, uh, I think a lot of people probably had like this, you know, what what's going on here? Chris Pratt's Mario and whatnot. But these are all fairly good actors and they've done very good voice acting. And the one thing to remember about this, uh, two things really, is that uh, first of all, if you've played stuff like Mario Teaches Typing, for example, where Charles Martinet is doing Mario extensively, that doesn't work. You can't do a Mario movie with that kind of accent and... Uh, inflictions throughout the entire movie that just like it will become too grating so that's one thing where i knew they just can't do that because that wouldn't you know, translate to a full-length feature film uh, the second thing though is that they actually did announce that charles martinet is in the film so they did keep in mind the fact that his legacy and the fact that the fans love him this much means that they will still honor him in this film and I thought that that was a very good thing to do when announcing these voice actors is to give him the same type of spotlight and say, hey, we haven't forgotten. We're not putting him to the side. He's here. He's going to be in the film. He's going to have multiple roles and cameos, in fact. So I thought that was a very nice gesture from Nintendo. The other thing that I thought was very surprising is that it seems like they're really embracing that that Donkey Kong Country lore in, in like, you know, bringing it directly into the mario universe you know it i guess it's referred to in like the donkey kong country games like with with the inclusion of cranky kong being the original donkey kong but they don't really talk about it i guess they really didn't talk about that aspect in a mario game until until odyssey beyond that though i mean there's not that much more to talk about on the direct stuff i mean in japan they announced super robot tyson 30 which is interesting (laughs) uh Yep. What was that other game they announced that was pretty uh, janky looking? Oh, Tolkien, though. Yeah, it was very choppy looking. I've had a few run-ins with DMM games in my career. Uh, but they primarily do PC games. This is originally a browser game, I believe. Uh, and uh, seems to be running as such on yes. the Switch as well. Uh, this will never come out in the West just due to the voice licensing. Because I looked at some of the voice cast and I was like, yep, this will never come out. Uh, and then Super Robot Tyson... Man, uh, it will never come out. It will never come out for the same reasons, but I do hope we get a Kagema, Kajanubo, and Mizuki theme song from this. Definitely. Is there anything else from this that you guys want to talk about, or is that everything? I don't know. I, I thought it was neat to see that, uh, that what is it, Voice of Cards, the uh, Isle of Dragon, uh, the Isle of Dragon Roars. You know, it's, I knew right away that this is, I said, oh, this has got to have some involvement from, from the near near team because the music was directly out of like seemed that it was directly from near and uh it's it seems like that w- that is the case emmy evans singing Do uh know? i have no idea i don't know okay but well, it's good to see a card game on a family friendly console yeah it is but the one thing that we haven't touched on that we won't touch on 
except for this, I guess, is the fact that the final Smash Brothers character is going to be announced on a separate date. So they did make note of this, and after that, Ultimate is finished. I'm excited to see who the final character is. The appeal of, of Smash for me is just seeing what stuff they put in it. Uh, uh, I kind of would hope that people have tempered expectations for that, because I just don't think... Like, first of all, there's everything that could be huge news is kind of in there already. So, But uh, I've seen some people say that it's going to be Son Goku from like Dragon Ball and stuff, and just temper your expectations... And have fun with the game star there. Don't don't worry so much about who it actually is. The final character should be the Nintendo console. I totally console agree. That I was... turns into like the NES, the Super NES, yes. N64. Like all of its moves represent different yes. consoles throughout Nintendo's history. One hundred. Give the GameCube startup attack where it's like doo -doo 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 -doo. that. Uh, that makes so much sense. You know, just just do that, and I think that would have been the best way to possibly close it out. And then, uh, essentially, I don't think that they even need to make another one ever. Nope. <laughs> I agree. But guys, guys, we've talked a lot about this Nintendo Direct. It's like 30 minutes of Nintendo Direct. So we should probably move on and keep our Direct moving uh, by going to the next topic. All <laughs> right. Uh, so, news item two then. Gentlemen, this one is a big deal. Um, recently, Sony released a new firmware update for the PlayStation 4. Whatever normal thing right no they actually fixed a serious problem uh so months ago i can't even, it was earlier this year i think we talked about what was known as the c-bomb which was essentially an issue on the playstation 4 where let's say if your cmos battery died and the time was reset the system would essentially have to reconnect to the playstation network if you didn't re-authenticate with their servers it would basically go into like a lockdown style mode you couldn't play disc games. Obviously not online games because you'd have to connect to a network first, but you couldn't play disc games. You were locked out of all your content. This is terrible for preservation. Uh, we complained about it. Lots of people complained about it. Some people said, why are you complaining about that? Don't be so mean. Uh, but in the end, it's a good thing that people complained about it because it's been fixed. Uh, Audie, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Uh, yeah, as you said, it was something that we mentioned on the show, and uh, honestly, I did not think that Sony would really look into this, because it seems kind of like not part of Sony's current MO to look back too much. They move forward, and they think mostly forward. So I was very surprised to see this, and uh, I saw MVG did a very good video on this, by the way, which uh, we'll link to in the descriptions. But yeah, very surprising, but good news, because there's a lot of great PS4 games, and I'm pretty happy that, at least for now, we'll be able to play these games in the future on the original Nintendo hardware. I'm very happy. I you know, I think that when the, the PlayStation 3 store and the, the PSP store were going to close down, that's really what brought this to the forefront. And uh, it's something that I didn't even know was a problem until everyone made a big deal about it. And it's it's really great to see Sony doing it and you know just just kind of moving ahead and doing it not making a big deal about the fact that they were doing it just you know just putting it in a, in a new firmware i feel like this must have been a part of that onset right the ps3 store again was something that all of us was actually quite invested in uh there was even planned i remember at the time for a a, a stream on uh, my life in gaming which all of us would take part in to kind of save the ps3 psn store and then they saved it before we could do the stream, um, which, uh, I mean, is good news. Uh, but we yeah. didn't have that much fun that weekend as we planned on. <laughs> but uh, we have to at least imagine that the backlash towards that kind of news also influenced this decision to do it for the PS4 CMOS bomb. Because, um, again, it's not really part of the Sony that I know um, these days to do this. So I hope that this is kind of like a step towards a little bit more fought from sony for their backwards compatibility stuff as well i actually think in this case i don't believe that this situation was intentional on their part i genuinely think this was a bug uh, of course they want you to authenticate for online downloadable games but for discs i really don't think so and i think because of the whole ps3 shutdown situation that almost happened uh it did raise awareness for this people were testing this stuff out and you know i'm glad to see that they actually listened and have corrected it well, so we're saying PS3 a lot here, but uh, do remember that part of that closure back then was the Vita, which uh, many developers, including myself, were still selling on. So I think with the PS4 situation, that's also another thing where the Vita is still fairly active for what it is. 
And then here now, there was also this additional story of the PlayStation 4, which you're saying, like, the bug situation uh, could essentially render it uh, useless. So I think Sony just kind of felt like we need to kind of step in and fix these things, because I don't think they really expected this kind of backlash to all this, really. No. Uh, but it is good that Sony is reacting. And, you know, just seeing the... You know, I I had totally forgotten that the Vita was even part of that. And there's still new Vita games coming out all the time. And it's crazy that they would even consider doing that. They probably have their reasons, but let's not get into that, those reasons. Right? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a whole different that's a whole different thing. Um and while we're talking about Sony related stuff, so last week we had a little segment we talked about the always online function of Gran Turismo 7. Huge bummer of course to all of us. Uh, but one of our patrons actually sort of linked to a plausible reason for why it's that way. Uh, you know, again, it doesn't really change anything for me personally, but I kind of get it. Essentially, Gran Turismo Sport and I guess GT7 are both FIA licensed. Uh, so with for this to have this certification, apparently to have it be legitimate, the, the lap times have to be presented or uh, recorded in a way that cannot be interfered with. So they need to be authenticated online. And that seems to be kind of an important part of GT now. Um, and the, the current guess is that because of this FIA certification, they've essentially had to take everything online. Uh, my complaint here is that I feel like they could have still offered the campaign single player kind of mode without this uh, completely separate from, whatever other modes there are unless they really tightly integrated um but at least it sounds like there's i guess you could say an excuse if you will or like a technical reason um for that so i thought that was interesting i mean i don't know what you guys think but well i would just like to set the record straight on one thing i prefer the colors in cruising blast over gt7 <laughs> don't don't start on this again this is <laughs> I, I guess that's it's okay if that's what they want to do. I I wonder what will happen though if you try to play it without connecting online. If they'll even be able to play anything. So that's so GT Sport, from what I recall, you could still play the game. I think, but there was it. Essentially, I think it made it so you couldn't really progress. But GT Sports progression was very different from what traditional Gran Turismo is. So I mean, they say always online. I guess it's one of those things we're gonna have to wait and see. Because uh, I just don't know yet, but it, it's it's a weird thing. So I guess we'll find out. Yeah. But anyway, let's move on <laughs> to the next topic, <laughs> gentlemen. This next topic, uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, apparently, Namco uh, or Bandai Namco has registered new Klonoa trademarks. Uh, specifically, uh, they registered Wahoo Ankoru and One and Two Ankoru. So like basically like an encore of wahoo being the klonoa sound and one and two likely referencing um klonoa one and two and there isn't doesn't seem to be too much more detail here but the filing of these trademarks uh and there was a klonoa encore trademark apparently that appeared two years ago but this makes me think that maybe they actually do have something in the works for Klonoa, and it kind of makes sense to re-release 1 and 2 on, like, say, the Switch. Uh, I mean, I love these games, right? Oh, they're they're incredible games. Uh, you know, I, I like the, the, the two console ones. The, the handhelds are okay. But, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would love to see a collection, and it, it, would, be, it would be nice to see Klonoa finally succeed uh in in the west i guess because there's been so many attempts at it that i feel that uh they eventually just gave up you know from even like the re remake of the first game on the wii which was is, is excellent uh it just you know just kind of faded away like you just couldn't catch on it's interesting because yeah we've seen these types of uh trademark registrations for a few things now bridge racer is another one which we mentioned yeah uh, and uh, generally when these uh, registered trademarks come up, it doesn't always lead to much, I will say that much, but uh, with uh, Klono, I know uh, from speaking with uh, Takahashi Kota a lot, who did the music for it, uh, he's always been very adamant that he wants Klono to come back. Uh, they tried to do that uh, cartoon a few years ago, 
which oh, right. uh, didn't work out. So there's always, I think Clonoa is very near and dear to people at Namco more so than just us. And so I think these actually do refer to some activity for the franchise because I do know that there's always been an attempt of keeping it alive. And uh, really, it's a bit of a shame that it's this late in the Switch's life cycle because I would think that the Switch, uh, of course, with a uh, next uh, console from Nintendo, I'm sure it still has the opportunity for it whenever that uh, shows up. But, you know, early in the Switch lifetime, if we had Klonoa 1 and 2, uh, I think Clono would have been an excellent addition to the Switch uh, family. And, Absolutely. Uh, my question would then be if it's uh, Clono uh, 1 and 2, the original one, or if they do the Wii 1 and then the PlayStation 2 2. Why not both? I would love oh, to have Oh, why not both? They should yeah, do right. both. Let's yeah. get the kids uh, gif up here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that should be it. You know, of course, is a complete collection. Uh, with even the handhelds, uh, even the volleyball sports on PlayStation. Oh, yeah, yeah, Why yeah. not? Bring it all. I want yeah. a Klonoa Heroes. Klonoa uh, Heroes oh, the, is excellent. The yeah. Game Boy Advance one, right? It's a cool, or the, the, it's a yeah, cool game. The, the RPG, RPG one. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it would just it would be nice to see Klonoa succeed here in the West. And I think that if there was a, if there was a time where he really could, uh, it's right now because, you know, that style of game is probably like that throwback style is more popular than it has been. And people are more receptive to it. And you know, this, this, this could be it. I sure hope so. I, I hope this, something comes of this. I also hope something comes of the Ridge racer stuff. Uh, my gosh. We're seeing like uh, the original composers have not been making music for a theoretical follow-up to the Ridge racer. Touch four. Uh, I'm sure you'll see something regarding Klonoa soon enough. Uh, if I've heard correctly from some places. So, um, yeah, I think there is some um, something here. I feel I feel a DF retro coming on, to be honest. It could be a DF Oh, retro. man. That might be what yeah. I'm feeling. Klonoa, that was the first video that I did on our on My Life in Gaming that I was on camera in. It was, like, it was oh, yeah, very, very I early in there. That. You yeah, will have yeah, to be yeah. on camera for our DF retro on it, too, <laughs> just to uh, keep you up. But one thing we all can agree on is that if Klonoa comes back, we do not bring back the original marketing materials. Oh no! Please no. Yeah, for those oh, that don't know, right. essentially, <laughs> essentially they uh, they positioned Klonoa, the word as a sexually transmitted disease uh, in all like the uh, advertisements, and it's um it's not not the best thing I would say. Yeah, whose idea? That's that insane. was what was in with the kids at the time. Mm, <laughs> yeah, that was a thing. But anyway. Well, we'll come back to that if it gets released, and we'll try to ignore that that old ad, of course. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to the next topic. Okay, <laughs> next up on the list of things to discuss, um, this is a little one, but it sounds like Digital Eclipse are essentially trying to re-release Marvel vs. Capcom 2, uh, which is an awesome fighting game from Capcom with a, I was going to say banging soundtrack, but it's 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 a little different than that. But, yeah, uh, that's not It's very one. special. <laughs> Uh, but Audie, why don't you tell us about this one? Yeah, so uh, actually Digital Eclipse have kind of come into this um, now in the later stages of this. But I think Maximilian Dude was the one who kind of started a fairly interesting conversation regarding this about preservation uh, from a cultural standpoint. Because uh, he argues, of course, I would agree that Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is kind of like a, a cultural artifact at this point, And it's really entered pop culture. Uh, and some examples were, of course, with the NBA Finals, they had done like the selection screen uh, thing. And uh, just all these moments in the fighting game community with Justin Wong, which have become memes. So, and of course, the Marvel characters themselves. And kind of, uh, I would say at the time, with the popularity of those characters, it wasn't like it was today. We had no MCU and that kind of stuff. So the Marvel games were really keeping those franchises kind of alive. Yeah. So these games are very culturally important. And they've been uh, impossible to buy. There are, of course, the ports for PlayStation and Xbox, which aren't perfect. The Dreamcast port is much better. And then Backbone, which had became Digital Eclipse, did a port in 2010, 2009? I think so, like. yeah, if I recall. Yeah, yeah, which wasn't, uh, from my opinion, isn't the best one either. I would still go with Dreamcast, uh, because Backbone back then... It was an early time in this preservation era, so they were doing stuff that was ahead of their time, but it was still not perfect. 
so no offense to anyone there. Uh, but Digital Eclipse, of course, now are saying that they would like to go back and update their port uh, to new systems. And apparently they are making some headway because we've seen now reports that Capcom is speaking to them. That's great. So oh, uh, that's, that's might, pretty big. Uh, this might be happening. And I'm pretty happy about that because, uh, yeah, Marvel is awesome. I'm not the greatest uh, and uh, Marvel fighter, but uh, I think it's pretty awesome to watch. And I've been to some of the uh, finals at like MAGFest and places like that with uh, Mr. Wong. And it's been amazing to see in person. Well, I think if they really want to get people uh, back on the Marvel versus Capcom train, this would be the way to do it because uh, whatever, like the Infinity, like Marvel versus Capcom Infinity, whatever, like the last one was. The, the first just, one. Yeah. Well, the, oh, no, the fourth there was one. the, first the one fourth was, one. Uh, yeah. PlayStation 3. Yeah. Did not do well. And I think they had a whole bunch of characters like DLC planned for it that they ended up canceling. And they didn't include any of the like, like the X-Men characters, because uh, it was before uh, D- Disney had bought Fox and or B- Fox uh, film cal- catalog and all that stuff. Uh, so if they want to get people excited about it, this is definitely the way to get them back into it and draw more attention back to the series. Yeah, I mean, with the MCU, what it is now, uh, and just comic books being kind of vogue, um, I would say that now is the time. And... Um, I think that Digital Eclipse, because I've seen some people kind of mention it, like, I don't really want Backbone to touch this again. And I have to say that this, uh, you know, we're so many years on now and so much more experience that I feel very confident, in they, fact, if they would touch it. They could do this. I, could I have a yeah. lot of confidence as well. Yeah. I think they could pull it off. More than anything, I want to see that original Morrigan sprite in 4K. <laughs> Yes, they can easily upscale that. Uh, they they will never change that. If there is a Marvel vs. Capcom five, I still demand that uh, that's yeah, like a skin swap same. for those. <laughs> yeah, that whole game though artistically was so weird. Like I love it at the time. Those backgrounds. But it was straight. Yeah. The backgrounds I thought looked amazing on Dreamcast, yeah. but they were high res, and the sprites, of course, were their original lower resolution sprites. So it was kind of this weird mismatch, but it's still charming. I like it. Plus. The introduction sequence is the ultimate. If you really want to show somebody what a CRT can do over like a flat panel, you show that introduction with the characters. But before you fill them in on Dreamcast, you know, the black outline and they move quickly across the screen. If you do that on a flat panel, it's just a nightmare. It's a mess. Yeah, it, it's smears, it smears into nothing. It's terrible. Uh, I, I like Marvel's Capcom just fine, but uh, I was much more into like Capcom versus I think A2 at the time and the others. Uh, but they they cleared up those rights a few years ago because that was in uh, some uh, weird place with SNK having done some work on the game and then Capcom doing some work, obviously. Uh, so that took a long time to clear up. And the one that I really enjoyed, which uh, we will never see again, is Tatsunoko versus Capcom. Uh, oh, I think yeah. that's one of the best ones and one of the fighting games I enjoyed the most during that era. Uh, and... Uh, I have some people I know at Capcom that like mentioned that like there's of course internally some interest in that, but the uh, Tatsunoko licenses in Japan and elsewhere is just an octopus web of like uh, licensing issues between voice actors and you know likeness rights and all this sort of stuff, uh, which uh, just means we'll never see that again. So pick up a copy if you see it. Yeah, I, that's one I definitely feel is probably going to be very expensive in the coming years. But that's enough talking about classic Capcom fighting games, even though we probably could do that for a while. Uh, <laughs> but we're not going to do that. Perhaps a stream at some point, yeah. maybe, uh, while you're here. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> next thing I want to talk about actually is something that is very exciting, I think, to all of us and just in general. It's Okay, so back in the mid-90s on the PC... Uh, a graphic adventure game was produced based on Beavis and Butthead called uh, Beavis and Butthead in Virtual Stupidity. It's phenomenal. It's a LucasArts style adventure game, only it's Beavis and Butthead, and it actually, it's good. It's legitimately good. I love that game. Here's the thing, though. They ported it to the PlayStation, but it only got released in Japan. Uh, we've all played that version, I think, uh, and it's wild. I mean, they dubbed them into Japanese, and it's just bizarre to hear. Uh, but somebody actually went through and 
did a translation of the PlayStation version, making this game now quite playable on a PlayStation. Uh, why don't you tell us more about this guy, uh, Audi? So, uh, as you know, John, I uh, do keep up with uh, most of the ROM hacking and translation communities. And uh, this was a hack that just came out from Mr. Nobody, which uh, I take objection to that name, sir. You've done uh, more for this world than most of us. <laughs> uh, but this uh, translation patch actually brings all the ja uh, the English voices back into the game and all of the English uh, overlay graphics. So this is uh, essentially now a complete version of the English version of Virtual Stupidity on the PlayStation, which we never got because it was only in Japan uh, from uh, Viacom, which uh, at the time was doing a lot of these uh, graphic adventures from the US over to Japan. And this was one of them. I uh, never really got the full story of why this uh, came out. I've spoken when I was in Japan, I've spoken to some people that had some kind of uh, secondhand involvement with marketing and whatnot, and I never got a clear answer to why. Uh, Beavis and Butthead was uh, a thing on late night television over there, but uh, not to the extent of getting a full PlayStation release. Uh, but uh, yeah. somehow they did. See, I think it's just the the state of PCs over there as well. It, it was less popular for gaming, and I think that's why we saw stuff like this. I mean, Phantasmagoria from the PC got ported over to the Sega Saturn on eight discs called Phantasm. Uh, so there's another one. Um, the Neverhood, which is that claymated adventure game I love, that got a PlayStation port as well in Japan called Clayman Clayman. And by the way, uh, the, the game Skull Monkeys was called Clayman Clayman 2. And in Japan, they even released Clayman Ice Hockey. The Neverhood characters playing ice hockey uh, or whatever. It's it's very weird. They, But there was this thing of like releasing these Western PC graphic adventure games on consoles in Japan dubbed into Japanese. Yeah, SoftBank and other companies like this uh, used to do that. Uh, Imagineer uh, oh, yeah. did that a lot. And uh, in fact, John, uh, as we showed on our Christmas episode, uh, this is my first time visiting you in over a year. And when I came over here, I gave you a American Japanese release, didn't I? Oh yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, ha I have them both now: the the PC ninety eight versions of Doom and Doom two, which uh, those are amazing. They come in shock box cases and everything. And uh, man. PC big boxes have nothing on these types of cases, I have to say. Do you have it there that you could you could hold up? We got both of these like this, essentially. Um, so, you know, it's like a plastic box like this, you know, and it's the full kind of case. And you pop, you know, you pop them open. You have a huge, you know, selection of different manuals and stuff in there. And then you know the, the the game on a disc. One of this Doom Two is on a CD, whereas uh, Doom One is actually floppy disks. And that first uh, Doom that I gave you, I gave it to you a few years ago. And now when I was in Japan, that was given to me by the original vocalizer that worked on that. From Imagine. So this this is something Dang. I love about PC style game releases in Japan is they all tended to ship in these giant cases, which are just uh. They're they're huge, but they're like you know really nice plastic kind of cases. They don't yeah crumple. You could almost away think it's like, a Neo Geo game. It is like that. It's that same kind of size. So yeah, I love it. It's really cool. Um, good stuff. So I'm I'm pretty excited to play this uh, translation though. Uh, what's kind of cool about the game is it is set up kind of exactly like an like an actual episode of Beavis and Butthead, and uh, it's it is. I was immediately blown away just how much better it was than any of the console versions that came out. Oh my god! It yeah. is it is far and away like it just destroys them. You mean the sixty bit games, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are not good. Uh, <laughs> the... Though graphically fairly, fairly impressive for their system, very Mike Judge's artwork translated mm -hmm. to sixty bit fine, but the gameplay is. Uh... That's the main thing is that the graphic adventure, like just the, the pixel art style captures it better in terms of like, it's not repetitive. It, it, they actually seem like real locations from the show, the way they're kind of drawn. And of course they have the voice acting. That's the key, right? The writing and the voice acting feels extremely authentic. Uh, and what you do in graphic adventure games is you, you, all, you click on items, you have your characters look at them, interact with them, talk to people. 
all this stuff. And what makes them fun is the reaction you get from the characters you're controlling. And because it's actually voiced by the original, you know, cast for everyone there, uh, you actually get some amazing <laughs> results from that. Yeah, it's really, it really is. It really it's is so good. one of the most perfect uh, licensed games out there from yeah. the era. It just this all reminds me though that I'm so sad we never got a console port of Duckman. Oh, the Duckman adventure game. That one is also incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Man, so much good stuff. Well, that may have been good news, though. I'll tell you what's not, and it's the next piece of news. So uh, last week we talked about Sir Clive Sinclair's passing, an uh, important figure in the history of the game industry and computers, especially in the UK. Uh, this week, unfortunately, uh, Mick McGinty passed away. So I think, Audie, you can probably talk about this one. Yeah, so this uh, hit me very hard when I heard about this uh, because I knew Mick uh, and... Uh still trying to kind of process it but uh mick mcginty was a uh, wonderful artist that worked on some of the uh, most iconic of uh, cover arts throughout the video game uh, generations uh of course uh, most famous is the street fighter 2 artwork that was uh, donned on super nintendo and even the championship edition on genesis he did uh he also of course did a streets of rage 2 on Genesis, along with many other things. Uh, and Nick was a wonderful person. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking to him several times, and uh, he always kind of made you a friend the moment you met him. And it's still very hard for me to talk about it, but uh, I was uh, fortunate enough that I got him a interview a few months ago for the new Street Fighter documentary that John and I have been working on. And uh, that uh, was shot a few weeks ago, and that uh, turned out to be the very last time he uh, talked about his work. It was the last interview he did until he fell too ill. So uh, I wasn't aware he was this sick, uh, and I only kind of learned about the news um, shortly before it uh, hit Twitter. So I'm sorry that I can't really go into more details. It's still a little bit uh, of a process. But uh, he was a wonderful person. Uh, his art was uh, only part of what made him wonderful. So I hope uh, with the coming weeks, months, and years, as we appreciate his art, we can also appreciate who he was because there's so much more behind made him an amazing person. Yeah, it's really, it's really too bad. It's really sad. Uh, I mean, I think of those, like, you know, Street Fighter Two, the artwork. Uh, I feel at the time, you know, like it may have been a bit divisive. <laughs> when when those when those games released uh but i've come to appreciate it over the over the years i think just it's kind of it has this like this hyper real but like you know it's it's a it's a stark contrast to japanese artwork for sure uh you know and i you know streets of rage 2 is another one that i had always uh thought looks like like very interesting, you know. It has it has a very similar look to the uh, the Street Fighter Two artwork. Um, I always remember like Max's face, you know, like you know, making that like yelling yelling face. <laughs> they're they're iconic, I would say. Yeah, you, you see, see those covers. Two's case though, I think that's better than the Japanese. It is better than the Japanese one. That was something I I feel actually a lot of these uh, great artists doing Western box arts uh, they achieved more often than you'd expect. I mean, obviously Tom Du Bois was another one who, uh, you know, I think his work for Konami was kind of better than what Konami was doing in Japan at the same time, which was kind of wild to think about. Certainly more iconic now. Yeah. I think it's so important and, uh, you know, credit to my life in gaming because they did a uh, feature on Tom Du Bois. Uh, I think, uh, what's interesting about it is that we tend to look at all that box art and often, like you said, Corey, it's like, it looks kind of weird. It has this kind of realistic uh, Drew Struzan kind of effect, right? Where it's trying to mimic the 80s type of uh, blockbuster cinema posters. But uh, what's important about it is when you hear the stories from Du Bois uh, and Mick, uh, Mike Winterbauer, these kind of people, is that they all looked at the game and tried to capture the essence of them. So if you look at the Street Fighter 1, they are fighting on the street. Blanca is doing his special move. And, you know, if you look at uh, Turbo, Street Fighter 2 Turbo, he did that as well. You see E Honda doing his uh, 100, uh, 100 uh, slap. 
Good. And uh, so it's clear that while it is kind of like out there sometimes in direction, the sort of essence is still there, and that's why we bought those games. Uh, that's very important to kind of notice that back then, this is before the internet, we went to the store, we looked at these box arts. Often we couldn't even see the back of them because they were in display cases. And it's like, well, I like that cover art. I'll buy it. And that's how we got these games. That's how I got Power Blade. <laughs> oh, and yeah. I think that, I think a lot of people, uh, as they as time has gone on, have gone on, uh, I think a lot of these artists didn't, don't really realize the impact that they had on a lot of people. And, I mean, we have really saw that with our Tom Dubois uh, like mini doc that we did is that, you know, we still still get comments on there saying like, I went to art school because of the art, like seeing your art. And like, now I'm doing this for a living and it's like, because of you. And, you know, like a lot of these people, they just thought that, I guess, like a lot of adults at the time probably didn't think they just like, oh, these, these kids games, like, you know, I'm just doing it. It's like a paycheck. They have no idea that they were, you know, re really making a huge impact on a lot of people. We should probably move on to the next section, which is DF content discussion. Uh, and this is basically just a chance to talk about some of the stuff we've been working on, some of the stuff that's coming out, and uh, we'll also do a little bit of my life in gaming uh, content <laughs> discussion, I guess, over here. But first, I want to start. Uh, the first thing, by the time you see this, I will have covered Death Stranding on the PlayStation 5. Not to go into too much detail here because, you know, you can watch that video, but it's good. They did a good port. Uh, it looks great, runs great, 60 FPS mostly. Um, lots of new features. Uh, it's just, you know, the save transfer function was insane. <laughs> it's the most absurd thing I've ever seen. Yes, we struggle with this. It, uh, I, I've been playing it with John this week. Uh, mm -hmm. I can back John up in saying that it is a very good port. Uh, you have a lot of the options to how you want to present the game. Uh, which uh, all work pretty well, uh, some better than expected. <laughs> so we go watch John's video to kind of uh, see what those uh, options are. But yeah, transferring that save, man. It was. It's <laughs> so I, about would, it. I, I don't want to dwell on it here, but let's just it's say. Not like transferring, is it? it well, <laughs> maybe. It's not a huge deal for me because, you know, if I'm playing this anyway, I'm going to replay the game and enjoy try the new content as it appears. It was just for testing. It would have been nice to be able to load the save but alas it is what it is but yeah go check out the video because aside from this gripe honestly uh i love this game i still think it's great um, i feel that the, the triggers will probably make a big difference they they do they actually i love what they did there they actually simulate sort of like the weight of objects so when you're carrying a lot of stuff and you're just on foot uh pulling the triggers becomes much heavier right so it's actually harder to stabilize yourself because of that. But then you get the power armor and suddenly the once you're wearing those things, they ease up unless you're carrying too much again. And then they start to bog down a little bit. But everything you wear, the amount of gear you're carrying, like all the, the triggers sort of vary based on that. And you feel all the little like the moving through the terrain and everything. It's uh it's pretty cool. They did a good job. And in fact, we set the controller down on the desk while capturing a cutscene. And, you know, they basically the rumble kind of works by essentially piping an audio file through the motors. Uh, and you could actually hear the sound of things happening uh, with, there wasn't sound playing through the speaker. It was literally just the vibration on the desk was reproducing the sound in a way that was really neat to see. That's pretty uh, wild, which is, which is cool. So I had forgotten yeah. that that was even so close to being out. Yeah, it is. It, it seemed like when it was announced, out. it was so far away. No, it's I'm just uh, getting getting all the new content stuff is pretty tough, uh, I will yeah. say. But uh, the, one of the most promising things, and we still need to unlock more, is uh, the the firing range they talked about, where it's like in the you th you think oh a firing range big deal, but it turns out it's essentially VR missions. Uh, yeah, that was pretty fun actually. It, they're actually really fun. Like you know, it's like here's this big course that opens up. With lots of dudes, you have to sneak around and do stealth and take guys out quietly. There's ones with BTs where you have to like eliminate all the BTs without getting caught, you know. And you're basically putting your tools to the use, and it kind of lets you play with and learn the mechanics in a way that you normally didn't get to do because the game was so focused on avoiding that stuff. So 
it it kind of shows that the mechanics there's a lot there there's a lot to mess with um and i think uh yeah it's it's nice that they essentially included this stuff it feels like the equivalent of a metal gear solid subsistence you know mgs3 subsistence or metal gear solid 2 substance or mgs integral it's that kind of release you know what i mean yeah uh I... so yeah good stuff but there's there was like vehicles added too, wasn't there, or something like that? There was like there's a jetpack. Like, there's more vehicles added. There's a racing mode. Uh, Is there a skateboard? <laughs> I mean, it seems like they would have. <laughs> you a could skateboard technically mode. you could skate in the original game by like uh, surfing down hills on top of like the uh, carrier pods. Yeah. So you can Yes, I know you really want to play that extreme skateboarding on PlayStation Two, Corey. It's further fleshed out, and I guess the most surprising thing was just how they. Uh, they actually redid a lot of the terrain in interesting ways. Like they added new ridges and like changed a lot of areas that you maybe couldn't get to before easily. Now you can actually get up there and it's almost like they were analyzing what players did and they kind of reshaped the world uh, to make it somehow like optimized, if you will, uh, which I did not expect. You usually don't see that in these kinds of re-releases, but there's a ton of that. Like just when I was trying to do side by sides, I'm like, okay, there's an entire all this area, all these formations, like this entire ridge, it's either all different or not there at all in the original release. Uh, but I said we wouldn't talk about it too long, but here we are going on. Because <laughs> I, I think we all like Death Stranding. So last week, the Ridge Racer DF Retro episode hit uh, for patrons. That'll be out public um, in some weeks, obviously. Um, the f Zero one came out a couple weeks ago, which was great. But the new DF Retro has started production, or just started production with you here. So because we started basically today, we're not gonna spoil what it is yet, as usual. I'm gonna find out what it is after we're done with this. Yeah, yes, yes you, exactly. We'll tell you. <laughs> this is the first time I'm visiting John in a year, so we are pumping out a lot of DF content for the Patreon and also for public. So there will be a lot of DF art play, uh, but also the retro stuff. We are kind of. Banking on that now because we don't know what will happen in the future. Maybe there will be a little bit of time until I can come back, or maybe I can come back next month. Who knows? But uh, we're kind of uh, putting it all in. And this new DF Retro, uh, can't say what it is, of course, but it is something where I think a lot of people have fond memories of it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of history to discuss. So it's kind of like that perfect mix of uh, my love for gaming history and John's love for technology. Lots of versions. <laughs> lots and lots of versions. If I if I could put in a little request, uh, if you guys are doing retro content, can I uh, get a Let's Play retro of uh, Slaughter Sport, a.k.a. Mondu's Fight Palace, a.k.a. Tongue of the Fat Man? Didn't you just play this on your charity stream? I did. I did, but I want to. I want to see you guys play it. Wasn't that how you went into? Uh, you actually went into a loss on the charity stream. Wasn't that due to that game? Yeah. I don't yes. know, man. What we could try, <laughs> Mondu's Fight Palace. There is yeah. a lot of oh, versions man. of that. Uh, I suppose we could do a DF Retro on it. We could specifically for you, Corey. All well, right, sponsored video. Okay, so speaking of Mondu's Fight Palace, what's uh, up in the world of my life in gaming? <laughs> uh, well, I'm I've been working on a video for far too long at this point. Uh, uh, I had a lot of like personal stuff going on this past summer so i did not get to get to create as much content as as i would have liked uh but i'm working on a video on the um on the super hd system 3 pro from terra onion uh which will hopefully be out by the time that people are watching this and uh you know we have a couple of other things in the works of course analog frontiers continues and uh some some you know well we'll see we we, we have a lot of ideas and uh we just we we kind of fell into like a little bit of a lull these last uh, like six months or so six six months to a year maybe <laughs> when you think about it uh, but it happens know, it, is, it is it is what it is you know we've run the risk of that before but then Richard's there wagging the finger saying no <laughs> hey, uh-uh, yeah. uh-uh. The whip. <laughs> and so the content keeps on rolling <laughs> speaking of rich uh i would like to mention one thing that was uh, last week he did that gamer nexus crossover and uh, i really enjoyed that video i just wanted first to kind of note how cool it was to see because uh, i do watch gamer nexus uh, i did that before even joining the channel and then seeing rich and steve work together was really cool and 
Uh, we kind of put this up before, but we love doing these crossover episodes. And, you know, if you have suggestions who you want to see us bring on direct, like Corey, of course, was a huge... Uh, My Life in Gaming is always one of those uh, big requests. And I saw a lot of your questions were regarding uh, My Life in Gaming, so that's great. Uh, but, of course, uh, if you have other suggestions who to team up with for the retro content or regular content, it's something we love to do. So, uh, call suggestions, or if you are a content creator, uh, leave us a uh, note on um, comments, Twitter, wherever it is. And I'm sure you know, we can keep doing this. Rich, thinking of that, though, Rich actually put out another video this week we should at least mention. Um, it was the one on the, the PS5 SSD stuff where he basically tested a below-spec SSD and found that it worked pretty darn well with the system. Uh, so we're really kind of uncovering some some sort of data about the way the PS5 works and the way the games work. And I guess my opinion now is that the minimum specified speed that that they recommend for an, an, a second internal drive on the PS5 is probably just sort of covering their butts, if you know what I mean, where theoretically uh, developers could use that spec in such a way that uh, a drive slower than that may not function correctly. And this kind of absolves them of that, you could say, where it's like, you know, if you're using an unsupported drive and you have a problem, you know, it is what it is, right? So it's kind of use at your own risk. But the fact that games like Ratchet and Clank actually work with a lower spec drive, it's pretty cool and interesting. So... It also kind of demonstrates that there's a lot more to it than just the drive itself. I mean, there's the hardware decompression block plus, you know, just their their actual design chops, right? So there's, there's a lot more to it. than You can't just slap in one piece of hardware and it just does it all. You know, there's, there's it's it's a complex process. and uh, But it is interesting to see it all work out. It's just a shame we didn't get that Xbox One SSD to work in the PS5. Richard got so close. It was so, so close, close. Uh, but it just kept crashing on the format. So that was an uh, intense week of Slack uh, <laughs> uh, when Rich was trying to do that. It was like every day. It's just like, well, Rich, what's going on? It's like it didn't work, chaps. It didn't work. <laughs> oh man, that would have been just fantastic. I would have loved to see it. I think if it would have formatted, it would have worked fine actually. But um, yeah, alas, we did not get to see that happen. Um, but anyway. Let's move on to perhaps our favorite part of the show. This is the part where all of our patrons can submit wonderful questions to us to answer on this very show, as they have done this week. It's patron Q&A. So here we are once again with the questions today. It's been a long episode, so we just have five questions to talk about. Uh, we're going to start with the uh, longtime listener and question writer, Eric Benoit. Welcome back, Eric. Uh, I only have two Patreon memberships, My Life in Gaming and Digital Foundries. You guys have the best content. Do you ever feel a tension between what content you want to make and what you feel your subscribers want? Ooh, that's a good question. Oh, we argue that's, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a full-out war. But generally, we all agree that as long as Game Sack is left out in the dark, out in the rain, we're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't I don't I think it's not about tension between us. Right. It's tension regard it's like when you have Biomutant Win, the tension between what some people want your channel to make versus what you want to make, right? Yeah. I just wanted to make fun of games that <laughs> That's fine. You can make <laughs> so you got what you wanted. See, the subscribers did not ask you to make fun of Game Sack, but you did it anyway. You got a bonus. <laughs> so we see where we see where you stand on this. But for me, though, this this is actually really something that I think about a lot. Like, you know, I love doing DF Retro content, right? And thankfully, we have the DF Retro tier, and I love those guys for their support because they've been very uh, just, you know, open and, and happy with everything that's pumped out, and I try to keep them happy. But everybody else, both, you know, the Patreon guys, not well, less so them, and more just like general YouTube subscribers, uh a lot of the stuff they want doesn't really jive with my interest these days. You know what I mean? I'm finding more and more. It's like, and it's, it's, it's tough because like, you know, certain games come out, you know, that if you do a video on it, like a if you, Assassin's Creed Odyssey gets a 60 FPS patch, for instance, that'll do big numbers. We probably should have covered that. 
I don't want to do that though. I wouldn't personally want to do that. I don't like that game and I don't want to talk about it. Uh, so it gets into this whole thing. Like if we did a video on it, the data would be good, but, uh, and it would probably do really well, but I wouldn't have had any fun making it at all. So I don't want to make that video. Um, but that's the thing is he kind of got a given push. It can't just be about what you want to do, but you have to find this like median in the middle where you got to find the stuff often that is actually story worthy and interesting to your audience, but also is something that you like. And thankfully there is still plenty of great stuff coming out that I think everyone that's watching tends to be excited about. And uh, also is stuff that I enjoy so that's kind of the strategy we've been employing and Richard's been really great about that where it's, you know, he kind of leaves it mostly up to us to decide what we'd like to do. And it usually kind of coincides with kind of exciting stuff. It's just that sometimes games fall through the cracks for whatever reason. And uh, the big problem is like Psychonauts 2, for instance, uh, I actually would have loved to have covered that, but I was off work when it hit, right? And people keep asking about it. The problem is to do it justice would be like a week's worth of work. And because it's like a month late now, um, I'm not sure that would be made up on the backside, right? Like if I really wanted to do it, I could, but it would just, it's just takes a lot out of you for something that wouldn't be that, I guess, exciting anymore. I don't know. It's, it's tough for me sometimes. I don't know. What do you guys think? Oh, I, I totally agree. I, I guess I don't feel it. I, I guess we at uh, my life in gaming don't really feel it that, like the same way that you do, because I mean, you guys have a, like a pretty strict release schedule. You know, our, our release schedule is like in shambles at all the time. And, uh, you know, you have so many videos uh, like a week that you need to release and you can only spend so much time. But the good thing about that is it keeps you very, I guess, efficient. And well, ours, you know, we take a long time and sometimes, uh, production tends to get a little bit too bloated, you know, and I'm always trying to figure out ways to streamline it. But, uh, you know, there there is definitely points where we know, OK, we got to cover this thing. We got to drop everything and cover, like, you know, the Retro Tink 5X because this is something that everybody is going to be asking about. And if you miss that window, then it's like. Even if you're excited to, to do the video when even when you miss that window, you just you kind of got to feel got to say like well this is not going to uh, have the kind of return as the amount of time I put into it, so that that is something that I think that we need to like we need to balance a bit better and we used to you know have very strict like two every two weeks release schedule and that meant that uh, we were constantly moving through things and uh, moving really quick and I'm sure as you guys know after doing that uh, PlayStation launch video. You know, like when videos get so long, like it doing that in a short amount of time becomes like like it's you feel so burnt out. You do want to do nothing. You don't want to look at a screen for a yeah. week afterwards. Yeah, 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 exactly. It really hits hard. Yes, to a certain extent. But that PlayStation video would look I mean, because I would personally say that, like, uh, I love working with John mm -hmm. so much yeah. that, like. I actually wanted to do more after we finished. <laughs> I agree. Uh, it's kind of strange one there, but uh, uh, I'm in this kind of weird spot where I can kind of avoid a bit of this pressure because I work mostly on the Patreon side. And so my content creation and my production generally is revolving around this uh, somewhat structured release time for specific types of videos like a Retro Corner, Retro QA, uh, premium behind the scenes kind of stuff so I don't have to worry too much about like coming up with the ideas or picking the games that will make the most uh, numbers show up on YouTube but rather I am more just stressed about getting everything out on time that people expect from our Patreon structure but luckily we have the most awesome Patreon fans so sometimes I can even be a bit late and I still don't get too much uh, BS for it the, th the thing is, though, when doing these types of YouTube channels, I actually think one of the things I've learned is that it's important to pursue the stuff that you're passionate about, because if you're not doing that and you're just doing stuff based on, oh, this will do big numbers, it absolutely destroys your motivation and the people watching feel it, right? It's not something that you can fake. You've got to actually have that excitement there. 
and uh, you look at a lot of the you know the places that succeed in here and you, you see the same thing they're they're going for what they're passionate about and that passion uh shines through and i think people enjoy that it's like commiserating and enjoying stuff together uh that's really fun and that's that's the best reason to make these types of videos in the first place i think i think this is why df as a team is as amazing as it is because i joined very recent and i mean it is something where i feel completely blessed to being part of because everyone is passionate and everyone cares about one another and everyone enjoys the process of what we're doing so we do have a little bit of freedom here to just kind of not only pick and choose in that sense but we can also join together yeah. where you know if john has a video and i'm like man i really enjoy that john is always like come up with me talk about it and alex as well we love working with alex for that reason because he's just so fun to work with we all, like we all like different things too which is which is really that actually is really fun like you know covering different stuff we all have our specialties and the things that we enjoy the most and uh it is a, it's a fun thing so yes and we love the crossover with for example my life in gaming because we've done the final fantasy 14 episode for example incredible work from trap uh cory on this episode incredible episode of the direct <laughs> so far we were both Corey in the, the final fight ruin it yeah well you know you were both in that final that fight so uh, opening sequence yes just in general, like I want to say really quick, I'm sure John feels this way, especially with the retro stuff, about how much of a difference it makes to have a partner to work on on something like that with. Because that is something that, you know, that I've I've fortunately had since we started the channel. But you have like done some incredible episodes, you know, like before, and that's just like stuff you probably were feeling so burnt out after that. But having a partner, it it makes it it just it makes it so much easier. Yeah, since we rebooted the Patreon, Audie's been my partner in DF Retro. Uh, but I've done two episodes since then that were pretty much all by myself. And after doing this latest Ridge Racer one, like the, it's such a difference. Uh, I did that on my own, and I felt it. It it was really difficult to get to the finish line, and so ha having a good partner to work with and team up with like makes these this so much more fun to do. I think it, it's just a huge difference. So uh, I love it. I relish that. We could talk about this stuff for a while, but we should probably move on to the next question. So uh, the next one comes from Christian Bringedal. Uh He says, new patron here, excited to be part of the DF community. I really enjoy your guys' work. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, now to my question. With the trend of timed exclusivity becoming more prevalent across all platforms, could timed exclusivity, outside of deals with publishers and platform holders, of course, be utilized as a way to mitigate heavy workloads and crunch for developers, i.e. focusing on one platform for launch instead of spreading development across several and then using the exclusivity window to shift focus elsewhere. Um, that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, what do you think, Audie? Yeah, so uh, I think it's a very interesting question. And in... A perfect setting this would definitely be the case you know uh you're totally right that it should be like that however as the world we live in i don't unfortunately think uh resources gets reallocated this way even with exclusivity uh because it's always an arms race so there are probably examples where i'm proven wrong and people did get more time because of the exclusivity but i think primarily exclusive or not uh, there still is very much a crunch nature that we need to deal with for video games. And uh, it's ongoing. Uh, I've been part of the industry for 20, 17 years, almost 20 years. And uh, it's been there since I started. And it's still there. And it's just, uh, it's a very difficult thing to figure out because you still have to deliver. So that's the kind of other side of it is that we need to eliminate crunch, but we also need to bring things out. And for different companies this means different things definitely and yeah i don't have much to add yeah to that. me either that's just kind of the way it is unfortunately um so let's move it shouldn't be that way it shouldn't be that <laughs> way i agree brother <laughs> <laughs> uh all right next question comes from nico simmons he says pledged yesterday finally for this week's direct 
and by the way he wrote finally i didn't say that i should know <laughs> that, that did sound a little bit uh you've yeah. been waiting your whole life for this oh uh, but anyway he says for this week's direct i can only think of one fitting question here to everyone where were you when metal gear solid 2 sons of liberty was released or alternatively can you recall your first ever session with it um john you i'll start first the video on yeah dude i was so hyped for this game i mean obviously i was there with the zone of the enders demo first which blew my mind and then the game came out so i actually drove over to the GameStop where it was going to be delivered a day early by the way and i had a friend working there and we ended up just playing tony hawk's pro skater 3 in a kiosk in the store uh for about an hour and a half until the delivery man pulls up in front pulls out the box and we slice it open and inside metal gear solid 2 sons of liberty i run home um pop it in and here's the thing i was actually nervous because the first ps2 that i got actually was starting to show issues with disc read errors but it was primarily only applying to cd based games but i was still worried that it might go on me at some point uh now we know how to fix that of course but at the time i didn't know any better so i was worried thankfully the game did play correctly and i pop went home popped it in and it's not a feeling you get anymore by the way because games take have to install but you know you come in flip on the tv flip on the ps2 pop the disc in and you're just whisked away and i remember not i didn't know anything about the story at that point right this was all a surprise to me so like you see raiden in that opening like sequence when you first put the disc in i had no idea who that was so just like another character in the game and then when they introduced him after completing the tanker section uh it it kind of blew my mind. I actually loved it. I know a lot of people were disappointed, but I thought it was super cool and really interesting. And that's gone down as one of my favorite gaming experiences uh, of all time. It's definitely an interesting experience for me too. I was working retail at Electronics Boutique at the time, and this was a game that I was looking forward to for a long time. And there's so many trailers came out from the time it was announced to when it was uh but until right before release. And like the last one was like eight minutes long or something. And it, it is so interesting looking at those because they, they swapped out uh, the riding parts, like, you know, with, with a character model of snake. And it, it was just, you completely in, in the dark going in. And for me, so I, I bought it day one and I uh, took it home after class and I played through the entire game in one sitting over the course of like all through the night. And uh, I smoked cigarettes at the time. I smoked an entire pack of cigarettes <laughs> when I was playing it. Goodness. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Corey. What am I? <laughs> well, you, you stopped. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been I've been quit for 13 years. But at the time, you know, I just I played through the entire game and I finished it right before I had to go to class the next morning. And I specifically remember thinking the more that the the more time went on, I was like, I'm going to be playing a snake any minute now, any minute now it's going to switch back to snake. And I, I, I really felt, I think probably like a lot of people did felt really betrayed at the time. And you look at it, look back at it now and think like that, that kind of thing could basically never happen again. I know it makes me sad, but you know, it was, I, I was very disappointed for a long time about it. And I think that, you know, it's just, it, it, I look at it now and I can't believe they got away with it. But at the time it was, it was a big disappointment. And that's the thing is that it was actually a surprise too. And they messed around in trailers to even fool people like Bungie would try the same thing in 2004 with Halo two with the Arbiter, uh, which I also liked. But that actually got spoiled because the game leaked early and people were out playing it and talking about it. So it didn't have the same impact. But I miss that stuff. I miss games releasing, not knowing what's in there and being totally like surprised. My expectations uh, turned upside down. Um, I don't know why people get so upset about that. Well, I, I look at it now and I think that it's it's totally fine. But it, it, in the moment, you know, I, I just I loved Metal Gear Solid so much that I was ready to see you know, to play as, as snake again. And you know, I felt kind of let down. <laughs> That's totally fair. Well, I actually bought some of the enders because some of the enders and didn't realize that the demo disc was there until I got home and saw 
that was there. Uh, so uh, I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. It wasn't as uh, heavily promoted in the PAL versions of the game, should be noted. I think that uh, it was a little bit more well known in the US, uh, this fact. But uh, I picked it up. Uh, I enjoyed the demo a lot. And I had enjoyed the original on PlayStation, of course. So I was excited. Uh, eventually, I got a VHS with a game magazine. And not the DVD, but the VHS of that demo that uh, we have upscaled on the channel. And John showed off in a VF Retro episode. I saw that and I was completely mesmerized by just all the detail and all everything you could do. So the first time I played it was on launch day. Uh, kind of similar to John, I went to a local uh, video rental store that sold video games with my friend. And we were there until midnight because they had gotten the box of the game. It was short. Uh, I don't remember how long after the US release this was. But for us, it was a little bit later. And we were there until midnight because they had the boxes, but the publisher for the European edition or the Nordic edition had said that you cannot sell it until this date. And they didn't want to break the street date. So we were there until midnight after they had closed their doors. And then, you know, finally they came out of the back room. And uh, it turned out that the people who worked there had been playing it the entire time we had been in the store waiting since like 7 p.m. So uh, they kind of spoiled a lot of things for us, unfortunately. Uh, they didn't spoil that thing, though. And I didn't mind the twist. Uh, so maybe not the most memorable. I don't have, like, a huge Metal Gear 2 story or anything for this answer. But man, do I have stories about Metal Gear 5. Because I was there with Kojima at E3 when he did the first gameplay uh, reveal. And man, was that an experience. And not the way he envisioned it, I think. Uh, so maybe one day on the channel I'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll have to do that for sure. That's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good question though. Um, moving on, and thank you for joining the Patreon. Oh, yeah, thank you to <laughs> uh, both Nico and Christian. I should say, heck yeah, but well, that's awesome. So next question comes from Fasta. It says hi guys, big fan of your work. If a theoretical PlayStation Five Slim were to come out in a few years, do you think there's a chance? it will be all digital only with a no disc option or even the PlayStation six for that matter. I know that John would not prefer this, but do you think the industry is heading this way inevitably? Uh, maybe eventually, but I'm not so sure it's going to happen to see it because retail sales are actually still quite strong, mm -hmm. believe it or not. And ultimately everything is still limited by internet pipes. Uh, in a lot of areas around the world, the internet still sucks or is unreliable and there's there's so many issues with it um i just don't see them quite moving away especially not during the ps5 generation if anything i could see them ditching the digital unit uh, yeah. for a slim the thing is though with the size of the ps5 a slim unit might might only be as big as the original xbox maybe <laughs> yeah, right. so um i'm not sure i lay awake at night dreaming about what I would do with all the extra space I'd gain from having a PS5 Slim. It's almost as big as my Panasonic UB9000 Blu-ray player. Uh, it's a big machine, uh, but you know, whatever. As a CDI fan, I feel vindicated in these yeah. days. As, uh, no more can people make fun of me. The PS5 is smaller, smaller than the CDI. Most but, of the but you CDI can set stuff on top of the CDI, at least. That's true. <laughs> Like a PVF? Yeah, like yeah, a PVF. Yeah, I actually have, exactly, you can do that. You can't do that with a PS5. <laughs> PS5 Slim. So, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't think about what these update. Like, it's so early in the generation, and this is a, a special generation, so I don't think anyone should sit there and really think too much about this. Quite honestly, I think it's uh, just, it's not going to happen anytime soon. A pro version, a slim version, doesn't really matter. Uh, I think uh, it's just uh, not an interesting conversation to have these days. But uh, the question of whether or not it will have a disk drive. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of friends from South America from when I used to live there. And some of them have the PS5 uh, that they've imported, uh, obviously. But still, the internet speeds does not allow them for even an easy time updating, <laughs> less, uh, much less buying full games. So internet i think for us who like live in europe or in certain places in north america we tend to think like well i have a fast internet i only buy digital why should i care they shouldn't do discs anymore but 
I think there's a higher percentage of people that don't have access to good internet uh, that would need physical. And there's many other reasons for physical. Uh, physical is still very much a viable uh, avenue of video games, and we should not be fighting it. Price is a big one because even now we already see it. You know, you go to these stores and games are discounted all the time. You can get disc versions of games for real cheap, but if you go back like to early PS4 games even, or like, you know, you look at the online store price on the actual shop on the system and the price, they're still like, oh, it's like 30 bucks for a game from 10 years ago that you could probably get for like five bucks physical, you know? And also just big sales and blowouts on modern new games as well. I mean, you just get better deals with discs because it's it's a larger marketplace competing rather than only one store. It's all good. You don't want discs to go away. And I'm, I'm sure you can think about many times in the past where you have gone to a store and just, you know, walked out with a stack of games that were on clearance, you know, that were like less than 10 bucks. I know that we've had experience like that where we went to Target one time and we both walked out with, you know, some copies of Shenmue 1 and 2 remaster or whatever, or HD and for like like eight ninety nine or something like that. <laughs> the same with like Soul Calibur 6 was the same. Yeah, uh, and Shaq Fu 2. Oh, yeah, well, that, <laughs> let's forget about that. That happened. Uh, one more question, though. This one comes from Luke, and he says, At John, how did you set up your Atmos speakers? And what is the allocation in your uh, AV receiver? I've been toying with the idea of buying Atmos speakers for quite a while, but it's a little confusing. Front height, top height, so on. So there's different types. So this is the main thing. Um, you, you, There are actually Atmos style speakers that you can buy and set on top of your speakers that like sort of aim the cone towards the ceiling. The, the idea is that it reflects the sound off the ceiling. That is one type. And the AVR actually should have all these options and walk you through it. Uh, to show you what you're configuring but that's one type of speaker you can buy and you can actually it allows you to set the position whether they're like sitting on the front speakers this the the somewhere in the middle you know all wherever uh and then the actual height speakers are the ones that you either mount in the ceiling or up high above your head and that's actually what i do so i have a pair of speakers right in the middle of my room right on the ceiling angled right down at my ears and those are kind of like I, on the receiver, I configured them as like the middle height channel uh, for Atmos. You know, I don't have, you know, I could go for even more speakers, of course, but limited room and all that. But for me, I have my rear channels all the way in the back of the room, somewhat behind me, and then the, the height above my head. And then, of course, the front speakers and the subwoofer and you can figure that up correctly. Uh, and again, the AV receiver should walk you through this. Most of them have pretty good on-screen menus now that lets you connect them correctly and kind of lets you know, all right, this is what the layout will theoretically look like. Uh, now I'm using the the Marantz SR7. Oh, I forget the name now. But one of the HDMI 2.1 receivers. And that does have that feature. So you just configure it, in this case, using Odyssey uh as well to sort of eq your room somewhat it's a little microphone thing and you can even get an app now on your phone to tweak it even a lot more which is really really useful but with that i mean i don't know i i actually let audi hear a couple atmos demos yesterday yeah it was my actually uh first time experiencing like a home theater atmos uh, um, sitting because with the pandemic and really like been around with people and whatnot so john has a very good setup he put that demo on and it was literally like you could kind of feel like the raindrops you know trickle down on you it's very strange when sound becomes so convincing that your mind and body sort of creates this phantom experience and yeah. uh, that's what atmos is all about so i was very impressed by it and uh hopefully when eventually as my retro grieving cave as richard calls it is finished uh, i'll get <laughs> a atmos set up there as well definitely it's well worth doing uh if you have the space and actually i'm very happy that specifically so obviously movies support that but uh xbox series x s and everything supports dolby atmos for games as well and it sounds incredible playstation 5 it does not support atmos and that remains disappointing they put all that effort into the 3D audio, but it's so focused on either headphones or like built-in TV speakers. Uh, I mean, you still get up to 7.1 or whatever 
you want out of the PS5, but nothing's doing like the sort of Atmos style presentation with the height channels. And that sucks. I would, I would really wish that was something that they could deliver with the system because uh, if you have the setup, it's awesome and you want to use it. That's pretty much it then. This is a very long episode, <laughs> but it was an absolute pleasure to have you join us for this, Corey. Yes, yeah, I was happy to be here. It was a lot of fun. And it was also a pleasure to finally record a DF Direct with Audi in the same room uh, right over there. It's been an experience. Uh, this might look better than I ever looked on camera, but the setup is a fantastic bootleg of uh, cords and Xboxes <laughs> to uh, support this uh, setup. So, uh, yeah, it works. That's what's important. You should put a picture yeah, of, your, of, this, of the makeshift setup we're doing <laughs> because it is, uh, it's wild, to say the least. And let me just confirm one thing that's come up on Twitter since you posted that, John. Yeah. I am not Brian Danielson. I see the reason. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that, too. I can totally see it. <laughs> uh, but that's going to do it for this one. So thank you to everyone for watching and making it all the way to the end of this DF Direct. And, of course, special thanks to the patrons. Uh, we can't do all this stuff without you guys, really. Um, but yeah, we'll be back with a new episode of DF direct weekly next week. Um, I don't know who yet, who's going to be on it yet, but we're going to find out at the time. So get excited. And yes, we are still working on getting this up as a podcast. Uh, we are inept when it comes to figuring out podcast stuff. So apologies for it that. It will happen. It... I made, uh, I made lots of, uh, progress on this, but uh, because of certain things, uh, it's just not as easy as uploading and putting the RSS feed. Uh, we are part of other companies and many other things. So just uh, bear with us. It will be on Spotify, iTunes, and of course, your favorite MP3 player from Philips. Yes. And of <laughs> course, we'll even make sure we'll try it. Oh, no, I guess we can't offer Zoom support, sadly. <laughs> I still have my Zoom. I wish we could. Yeah, yeah, is it the brown, the brown one? And the brown I have the red one. Oh, okay. oh the red one. I love the Zune. What the a, Zune was a great product. <laughs> gone, gone too, too soon. soon. Gone too soon. Uh, but we are not gone too soon because this was a very long episode. So we will see you next week. Take care.